And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made, his shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds, with a knop and a flower in one branch. And three bowls made like almonds in the other branch, with a knop and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds, with their knops and their flowers. And there shall be a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same and a knop under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Their knops and their branches shall be of the same, all it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. And the tongs thereof, and the snuff dishes thereof, shall be of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all these vessels. And look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. But today we're going to talk about what many people would call the candlestick. Some people call it a lampstand. Uh, whichever way you call it, we're going to explain a little bit today. And it's one of the most beautiful pieces that was found in the tabernacle. Oh, by the way, we're continuing our tabernacle series today. We're going to talk about the lampstand and yada, yada, yada. Is it all right if we just bust up some of the old church like stuff we've been doing around here? Is it okay if I don't preach a series four weeks? And we just have a move of God and who cares? And do I have graphics and do I have a handout? And do, let's just have a move of God. So something interesting about this thing, it was built out of one block of gold. One thing of gold, they took it, and the gold weighed one talent, and a talent is equivalent to 125 pounds of gold. How many of y'all would like 125 pounds of gold in this place? Granite Jesus right now. Let, let me tell you why. If you don't know whether or not you want one pound of gold or 125 pounds of gold, let, let, me, let me give you some little figures about that. The present price of gold as of Tuesday was uh, $1,665.65 per troy ounce. If you don't know what troy ounce is, then you'll need to go figure that out. All right, it's a little bit more than an ounce is what it is. So if this was 125 pounds of gold, then that made the cost of just the materials of it $2,981,476.81. So how many of y'all would just like the golden candlestick to fall into your car on the way home today? Now remember, tithing still is applicable. Okay. $3 million just for the materials of it. Now we know in our day and age, and I'm going to apologize to all the contractors after the service, that if we asked them to build this, and they would say, well, we're going to take the material cost, and we'll just, at minimum, double it. Six million dollars to build this in today's numbers. So the value of the workmanship was about three million. The value of the supplies was about three million dollars. This was some piece of workmanship. They took one thing of gold, and they beat it into this. The only other item that you could compare to this in the tabernacle that was beaten out of gold was the mercy seat. And we're now moving from the outer court. We went from the, the gates of the court and the, and the curtains. We went through the brazen altar out in the outer court, which was made of brass. And then last week we talked about the brass laver. So we're moving, we're changing materials because in the outer court is brass, but now we're moving into the holy place and the substance of the materials are changing. Out in the outer court where we have brass, we're talking about the judgment of God. 
But now we're switching away from the judgment of God and we've entered past the judgment of God because the judgment of God has been satisfied by the blood at the altar and by the water of the, of the, of the labor. And now we're moving past the judgment of God because the judgment of God has been satisfied. We're no longer looking at the brass. We're no longer worried about the judgment. The judgment of God is behind us and now we're entering into the most holy place and now it's no longer brass, it's gold. And gold is not representation of the, the judgment of God, gold represents the deity of Jesus Christ. So once we get past the judgment of God and we enter into the holy place, we're not worried about how mean God is anymore. We're not worried about our sins taken care of anymore. We've already settled all that. But now we're in the holy place and we're seeing Jesus Christ. The most expensive, most ornamental piece in the tabernacle is the lampstand, the light that shines on everything else that is in that room. And once you get in in that place, you're not focused on the altar of sacrifice anymore. You're not even focused on the bronze or the, bra the, the brass labor. Your only focus is on Jesus. And when you begin to focus on Jesus, you start seeing the beauty of his holiness and the beauty of his appearance. Can I just say to us many times why we don't have the move of God that we desire to have is that too many of us are in the holy place looking back out wondering about the judgment of God. But when you get into the holy place, it should catch your attention. Jesus should catch your attention so much that your focus is never back there on what you brought in to have sacrifice at the altar. So in other words, you're not worried about your addiction, your hurt, your hang up, or your habit. All you're focused on is Jesus Christ. And why do I want to leave the presence of Jesus to go back out and pick up my addiction and my hurt and my habit and my hang out my focus is just on the light of the world and when you get focused on the light of the world man and you're not worried about your hurt and your hang up man you can get radical in your worship but most of us are wondering I wonder if he remembers what I did on Monday well if you asked him to forgive you you're already past the altar and you're standing before the light of the world so go ahead and worship Jesus and forget about the stuff that happened in the outer court. Forget what happened on the outside of church when you get in church. And just focus on Jesus. So let me just explain this to you. They have, they have, there's a shaft or you can call it a stem. And then you have three. This is all one solid piece. And then you have three little branches off. And most people would think these were wax candles on top of it. And because no one has been able to compete with the workmanship of Bezalel... It's not going to be exactly what I'm going to talk about here today, but they did marvelous doing this. Bezalel was anointed for all workmanship, and he did not create something that melted. It was not candles that melted. Instead, they were lamps. There were seven lamps across the top of it, each holding about a pint of, of oil that would burn because God doesn't melt. God doesn't decrease. You put, lamp, you put wax candles up here, it, you have to light them, and then you watch them melt, and then you got to replace them. They just had to keep refilling the oil of the lamps. And it was one of the requirements of the people was to bring oil so that the light would never burn out, that it could be burning continuously. It was one of the things that God asked the people to bring was oil for these lamps. And they brought oil so that there was so much oil that these lights could burn as long as God desired for them to burn. And so this candlestick or this lampstand was uh, they would call it a calyx and it's a botanical term and they, they had, it had bowls and it had knops and some scriptures render it flowers some render it lilies but most biblical historians agree that the bowls were almonds and scripture states, some say that the scripture talks about that knops, that they were pomegranates. So if it was that way, you had almonds and you had pomegranates. Almonds represent something, we'll talk about that. But pomegranates most often represent the fruit of the spirit. And we know that we're supposed to be like Jesus. There isn't anybody that represented the fruit of the spirit more than Jesus Christ. But most people just say it wasn't pomegranates. Everything about it, the bowls, the knops, every bit of it represented an almond. It was all about these almonds. And upon those almonds then were these seven lamps. 
The Bible then doesn't even really give us a description of it. I, I went with tradition when I sent the measurements to Miss Allegra. Uh, tradition says that it stood about five foot tall and about three and a half foot wide. That's tradition. We don't have anything in the Bible that says that. So if you're looking for it, it's not there. There's no definitive thing that says it. But tradition says it stood about Pastor Jason's height and it was about Pastor Jason's width. You all remember that then. And then it was beaten into its shape. In Exodus chapter 25 and verse 38, they had accessories, tongs or snuff dishes. The word tongs is translated as a snuffer, something to put out the lamp. And the tongs then were used to dress the wicks of the lamps. And we'll talk about that when we get into the table of showbread. Then in, he, in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 6, they, those, the, many people believe that the same tongs that took the coals off the altar are the same tongs that were used here. The same word in the Bible that's translated as censer or fire pan also is talking about a snuffer or a snuff dish that they would use in the tabernacle service. I'm moving very quickly to get you out of here to talk about on time. And all of, all of this, more than likely, was made out of pure gold. Everything around this piece of furniture represented Jesus Christ. There was nothing involving the operation of this lampstand that had any impurity in it. Keep that in mind. When we're coming around Jesus, we don't need to bring our brass or our hurts or our hang-ups those should already be taken care of. When we're in his service, whether we be trimming the wick or using the tongs, we need to be right standing before God. Amen. That means we need to make sure that we go through the altar, through the labor, and we're in his service. So then he says, the oil for the light, next is chapter 25 and verse 6, that there was to be oil for the light. It was a contribution of the people to the tabernacle. And he says it here like this. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring pure oil, olive, beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. Exodus chapter 27 verse 20. And Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 2 also references that. And the olives, notice it said that the olives were to be beaten. The lampstand was beaten. It was not molded. It was beaten into this shape. The olives were not put into a press to get their oil. The olives were beaten in order to get their oil. I'll come back to this point again. Just amen it like you've never heard it before. But because this is a representation of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was not molded to the cross of Calvary. They beat him and put him on the cross of Calvary. So both the oil and the gold were beaten because this is a type of Jesus Christ. He was beaten and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes you are healed it was all through the beating process of Jesus that you and I are afforded the luxuries that we have as being the children and the sons of God so this is a type of what was going to happen to Jesus he was of one piece and he was beaten into that place and the, then the oil as well and so likely what they would put this uh, lampstand onto the south side of the room and it would, it would emit light out into that whole room. And the branches would more than likely be running parallel to the walls. The ceiling, the front entrance, and the veil are all now visible in the color in which God commanded them to be because there was light. Without the color, or without the light, none of the colors that God commanded to be in there would be able to be identified because, guess what? It would be dark. Without the light of Jesus Christ on all of your lives, everything that God called and commanded you to be would not be recognizable without the light of Jesus Christ. So you may have a destiny over your life, but without the light of Jesus, no one else will be able to recognize what God has called you to do unless you have the light shining on your life. And so then the walls on the two sides... And all the furniture that were all polished gold, when this lamp, all seven of these lamps were lit, everything in the room was now able to be beheld with the eye. Can you imagine if we put gold all over this room? We had enough people complaining about how much money we spent on this. You know, there's a bunch of homeless people and you, all that money could go there, go there. Can you imagine if we'd have built this out of gold? 
But in that room, when you walked in, these seven lamps lit up the whole room. Lit everything up. The bread at the table of showbread, the bread of life was not able to be seen without the lamp. Nothing else in the room could be seen without the lamp. Let me just pause here for a minute. You can have all the Bible studies you want to have, but if you eliminate Jesus out of the Bible study, nothing's going to be able to be seen. You can have all the church services you want to have, but if you eliminate the light of the world out of it, it's just going to be a bunch of music. But you can have people who can't sing a tune and can't carry a tune and can not even have any musical instruments. But if they got the light in there and when that light hits on what they're doing, then the whole world can see Jesus in their midst. See, because it's not about talent. It's about the anointing of the oil of the light of the world that happens into worship. So I don't care if you can sing or not. When heaven says go, oh, oh, go, oh, oh, because it doesn't matter whether you can carry a tune or not. But if you're singing it to Jesus, he's going to light up your worship and other people are going to love what they feel when they're around your worship. I love that part because I live with Melissa. And if I'm comparing my worship to her ability, I would never do anything. But I'm not worshiping according to her ability. I'm worshiping about how much light has been shown into my life. <laughs> Question would be, why was this thing all about the almonds? It's all about, everything's about an almond and the whole shape of it was to be in an almond tree. Why was it the design of God to make this in the shape of an almond tree. And I know you're looking at that going, that's not an almond tree. Again, Allegra is not Bezalel. <laughs> but it was in the shape of an almond tree. Because there was, a, there was a, a, an event that happened. Moses appointed Aaron under the command of God to be the high priest. And there was a group of people who didn't like Aaron being their high priest. Matter of fact, they said, we can be a better high priest than Aaron. And who appointed Aaron in the first place? His brother. Why should we have to accept somebody to be our high priest that his family member appointed him to be our high priest? We don't like that. We think we can do it better. And God said, all right, Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell every tribe, all 12 of them, I want all 12 of them to take a piece of dead wood and I want them to inscribe their name on a piece of dead wood, write their name on it, carve their name into the wood. And I want them to bring their 12 dead sticks and I want them to put their 12 sticks with their name on it. I want them to put it into the tabernacle and then I want everybody to leave and then I want you to come back the next day and the one piece of dead wood that has been brought to life Whosever's name is on that dead piece of wood that now is budding, that's the one that I have declared to be the high priest. So obviously the tribe of Levi, they appoint Aaron to be their representative. So Aaron inscribes his name on his piece of dead wood and all the other 11 guys, they bring their pieces of dead wood and they put them into the tabernacle. They all leave and the next day when they come in, Aaron's piece of dead wood has now sprouted almond buds on it and not only did it have almond buds on it, it actually had live almonds on it. A piece of dead wood has now been proven by God that God said it wasn't Moses who appointed him as the high priest priest. He's my choice to be the high priest and how I'm going to prove to you that he's my choice of the high priest is I'm going to cause something that is dead to come alive and not just come alive a little bit. I mean, it's going to be fully alive. It didn't just say, oh, look, there's a little bit of water on it. No, it had the buds and it had the fruit on the stick. Because there's many people that wonder, how can the father appoint his son as the great high priest? And here's what he said. All right, if you don't accept my choice and you understand that Jesus Christ is the high priest, here's what I'll do. I'll put something dead into a little room and the one that comes alive again is going to be the high priest of my choice. I, I hope you're mopping what I'm dropping here. So God said, all right, every time they walk into the room and they look at this lamp, I want them to be reminded 
that the high priest is the one that has something that was dead that come alive. And every time they would look at the lampstand, it was an almond tree to remind them that something that was dead came alive and Aaron was their little type of the high priest. Why would they choose an almond of all things? Well, the almond was the first thing that would bud in the spring, if you will. Everything else waited and it was in hibernation. But the almond was the first thing to bud. Everything else was dead, like it looks right now after them 50 mile an hour winds right now. Not a bud, not a tree leaf, not anything. Everything looks dead. And what are we all hoping for? Lord, let spring come. What does spring mean? Things are getting ready to get back to life. I no longer have to wear a coat, a scarf, and gloves, and heated seats, and hearing heated steering wheels. I no longer have to go out and start Melissa's car 25 minutes before she thinks she's ready to go. I never have to do any of that. Lord, send summer flip-flops, shorts, and t-shirts. I don't have to take five suitcases. I can pack it up in a duffel bag and off we go. The weight and the burden of winter is over. Can I get an amen? How many of y'all want to move to Florida? Why? Because you don't want to go through the dead season. Now what happens in Southern Illinois? Every now and then it'll get a little warm. And it tricks the trees. It's like it's 81. It's time to come alive again. And then it gets cold again. And then it gets warm again. And the tree's like, all right, maybe it's time to go. Every time they would be walking and they would see that almond, the almond was the first thing to come out of hibernation, if you will. It beat everything else out and showed that life was getting ready to come. So it's just like us. When we see that 81 degree day, we're like, well, maybe winter's not going to come. Maybe, maybe February is going to roll into June. Maybe we're going to have a good time. But the almond was a sign that life was getting ready to come again. So when they see this, it beat everything else to the punch. They thought that when they killed Jesus Christ, that he was going to remain dead. He he said, nope, I'm just like the almond. I'm going to pop up before anything else ever comes to life again. I'm going to be the first one that's going to come to life again. But it's a sign that other things are getting ready to come out of the grave too. Because that's all they wanted was a sign. When Jesus came on the scene in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38, the Jews came to Jesus saying, they were church folk, Master, we would see a sign from you. The next verse, Matthew 12, 39, Jesus said, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. So in other words, Jesus said, All right, you want a sign? I'll show you a sign. So he turned the water into wine. That wasn't good enough. Show us another sign. So he multiplied the loaves and the fishes, and he fed thousands with a happy meal. Show us a sign. So he calmed the storm and he stilled the seas. Show us a sign. So he makes the elements obey his voice. Show us a sign. They came to him and said, if you are the son of God, give us a sign and we will believe. So he healed the sick. He made the lame to walk. He cleansed the lepers. And what did they do? They came to him and said, show us a sign. Give us another sign. So what did he do then? Makes the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the dumb to speak. And they came again and said, show us a sign. If you are the son of God, give us a sign and we will believe. So he raised men from the dead. He walked up to the tombs of dead men and ordered them to come alive and come forth. And again and again, they would come back and say, he saved your soul. Brought you the spouse you wanted, healed your baby, blessed your finances, gave you a job, and still we say, show me a sign. If you'll do, so we don't say show me a sign, we say, Lord, if you will do what I have asked you to do, then I will do. You're saying, show me a sign. Lord, if you'll do this, I'll worship you. Lord, if you do this, I'll be faithful. Lord, if you'll do this, I'll do this. I want to say to you, he has done enough for you, for you to worship and for you to be faithful. 
But we are just like that evil and wicked generation. Show me a sign. And yet all around us, he's showing us signs. People are being delivered and healed and set free. And revival is breaking out all over the place. And people are saying, well, if they would have just sang a different song, if they would have just worshipped a little lower, if they would have done it just my way, then I would have done it. I want to tell you, if Jesus has saved you, then there is enough for you to worship and praise God for the rest of your life. Oh, but I want, no, no, no. Show me a sign. I want to be like the Houston Astros. I want to bang trash cans to tell you that God has already given you a sign. You know what pitch is coming. He's already given you everything you'd ever have need of, but we keep striking out because we're not watching what God is actually doing. We want something big and majestic to happen right smack dab in front of us, but can I tell you that something big and majestic actually is happening right in front of you? God is working in ways that you could never imagine right now. But CNN didn't cover it, and Fox didn't cover it, MSNBC didn't cover it. No, but Jesus covered it. Going to get tied in here a little bit. So they said, oh, yeah, but we want a sign. If you're the son of God, give us a sign, then we'll believe. So they nailed Jesus to the cross. Then they walked by the cross, and in mockery said, Matthew 27, 42, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Come down off the cross and then we'll believe you. Jesus had already said, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. He said, there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He said in John chapter 2, verse 19, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But the reprobate Jews, the church folk, were walking by the cross and mocking and dared Jesus to get down off the cross. They didn't even remember that he said, I'm not going to come down off the cross. I'm going to stay on this cross. I'm going to allow you to bury me in a tomb. And three days later, I'm going to be, re be risen from the dead. But they mocked him and thought, well, he should get ahead of his own timetable. He should get ahead of his own prophecy. This is what many of us do right now. When God says he's going to do something for us, we get angry when God doesn't move the timetable up to our our satisfaction but if God made a promise to you he will complete and fulfill the promise as he spoke it to you and not according to your timetable but according to God's timetable this is what got Mary and Martha all worked up they thought that Jesus should show up when they thought he should show up but he said I'll show you something even when you think I'm late I'm right on time even when you think I'm not going to show up I'm already showing up So they said, Jesus, come down off the cross. And Jesus said, all right, I'll do one better than that. I'll hang here. I'll hang here till I'm dead. I'll let you bury me in a tomb. I'll put you, let you put a great stone over it. I'll let you seal the whole tomb. I'll let you even place guards to protect it. But you go ahead. You put me in the tomb. You guard it. You seal it. But I'll be back. You do whatever you want to do, and it won't stop me because I've already declared what I'm going to do. You can go ahead and try whatever you want to try, but I'm getting ready to show you a sign that's bigger and better than what you were asking me to do while you were mocking me on the cross. Because what would have been more sensational for Jesus to get off the cross and walk out while he was still alive through the crowd or let himself give up his ghost, go to a tomb, and then come back three days later and say, hey, I'm alive. But instead he said, you know what? I'm going to let you kill me. I'm going to be buried. Three days later, I'm going to raise myself from the dead. See, it's one thing for a man who is alive to bring another man who was dead back to life. It's something far different for the dead man to raise himself. Let me just put it to you like this. Let's just get down to this. Jesus was more powerful dead than the devil was alive. <laughs> let, let, let me put it more like this Jesus is more powerful when you think he's late when the enemy's already present oh but 
the doctor already said, nope, by his stripes, you already healed. The enemy may be present, but Jesus is more powerful when you think he's late, even when the enemy is present. That Jesus was more powerful dead than Lucifer was alive. Just ask Lucifer, who took your keys? Well, Jesus did. I thought he was dead. Yeah, nobody showed up while he was dead. And he took my keys to my kingdom because they weren't his to begin with. And Jesus said, I hold all power in heaven and in earth in my hand. I love that. Jesus is more powerful. More powerful than any ever thought he could be. Jesus had already said in John chapter 10, he said, I'll lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. And I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. So Jesus has power to give life to things that were dead. And Aaron's rod that but is signified the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A rod that was completely dead, cut off from any life source, and it brings life, and it represents Jesus Christ. So when they would walk into the tabernacle, they saw the almond tree, something that was dead, that came back to life. Now, they had no idea Jesus was coming. We see this, and we see Jesus. They just knew that this represented resurrection. Something that was dead was going to come back to life. When we walk in and we see this, this is Jesus, who was dead and came back to life. And he is the light of the world. Resurrection and life is God's proof of an eternal priesthood of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. And so it set forth this imagery of the buds, the flowers, and the fruit all on that golden candlestick. The Hebrew word for almond means wakeful or hastener. It has been given that name because it is the earliest of the trees to awaken after winter. The almond, wakeful or the hastener. This is the type of Christ, wakeful or hastener. When you see the almond, when you see Christ, something's going to wake up and something is going to be hastened. How many of you like to go to cemeteries? If you do, we might need to make an adjustment. That's why I don't like dead church. A cemetery has to be one of the worst pieces of property in the world. Every community on earth has one or more, and it has become a necessary evil. We hate cemeteries because they rob us of something that we loved. It becomes the most dreadful place on earth. We pass by a cemetery, the one especially holding the graves of our loved one and without, and then all of a sudden this deep emotion just overwhelms us because in our minds that has become something final. Oh, but my friend, I think we should start planting almond trees in the cemeteries because something is about to wake up and something is about to be hastened. Because soon and very soon, a trumpet is getting ready to sound. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet who? The one who was the wakener and the hastener will meet him in the air. And, and just so you get an idea of what we're going to say when we get up out of here, we're going to quote a, a scripture out of Corinthians. Oh, grave, where is thy victory? And oh, death, where is thy sting? Why? Because the old tree, Jesus Christ hastened the spirit that's within us and out of the graves we come to meet him in the air. So shall we ever be with the original almond. With the Lord. When that trumpet sounds something amazing is going to happen. And out of that, something that was dreadful. A place of seeming defeat. Because of Jesus a place of dread and defeat now is a place of victory. When you involve Jesus into anything that was a place of dread and defeat, he has the power to turn it into victory.
And I know there's some of you, we're not even talking about a cemetery. You just feel like there are things right now in your life that are dying. I want to invite you to invite Jesus into that area of your life and that area of depression and dread and that place of defeat. If you will involve Jesus, he can take any area of your life that there is defeat and turn it into a victory and he will hasten it. It'll happen quicker than you ever imagined, right? Because the rapture will happen like this in a moment. In a twinkling. What's a twinkling? It's the blink of your eye. Go ahead and count that. Try it. In other words, just be Joe Olstein for like five seconds and see how many times you blink. Now I know who you're all watching. Uh, he doesn't have resting pastor face like I do. He can get away with that. Yeah, everybody good? Melissa's texting me right now. <laughs> when you see this, matter of fact, every time you see a lamp, it should remind you of the resurrection. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. So it has almonds all connected out of one piece. Then he said there would be oil, the fuel for the candlestick. Throughout Scripture, anointing oil or oil is a divine symbol of the Holy Spirit. Oil was constantly used in anointing or consecrating persons, places, or things. In Exodus chapter 29, the high priest was anointed. In Exodus chapter 40, the tabernacle and all of its furniture, they were anointed. In 2 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 4, the kings were anointed. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 16, the prophets were anointed. Lord the, Jesus Christ is called the anointed one. The word Messiah literally means the anointed one. There's something about an anointing that rests upon us that when something is anointed, we need to take notice of the anointing that we're watching happen in front of us. In Isaiah chapter 61 and verse, verse 1, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, the scripture says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. There's an anointing that comes on you when the Holy Spirit is resting in your life. That power that's on the inside of you, that is God's stamp of approval on what you're doing in your life. There is an anointing on you. And the reason why the enemy likes to fight that anointing that's in you and on you is because the anointing is what destroys the yoke of bondage. This is why the enemy loves for you to hang out in the outer court under the judgment of God instead of walking into a place where the oil and the anointing is happening because when the oil and the anointing begins to take place, you're not worried about the judgment of God. You begin to take authority over the things that are bringing judgment on your life and bringing judgment on your family because the anointing that rests on you does it break the yoke? It destroys the yoke of bondage. In other words, the enemy, try as he might, can't glue it back together again because if it was broke, he could repair it. But the anointing destroys the yoke of bondage and cannot be put back onto your family, onto your marriage, onto your finances, over Heron, over Carbondale, over Marion, over Illinois. And so when you walk in your anointing, you destroy the yoke of bondage. Destroys it. Cannot be put back together again. There were seven lamps that were fueled by oil. Seven lamps. This lamp stand here is also a type of the vision that John had when he was around the throne of God. John declared that out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Revelation chapter 4 verse 5. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. The similarity is so plain that the imagery of the tabernacle candlestick is also the same imagery that is around the throne of God. 
So while the seven-stemmed lampstand represents Christ as being the light of the world, it also represents the sevenfold Spirit of God. Can I tell you that it isn't just about taking Jesus out of the building, but when we allow the light, the, the anointing to go out of a building, we're taking out the Spirit of God out of a building. And a building that doesn't have the Spirit of God and a building that doesn't have the anointing is a house that's in bondage. Because if you're not anointed, you can't destroy the yoke of bondage. But if you'll get anointed, you'll start taking authority and destroying the things that the enemy is trying to put on your family and on your home and on your finance because you're anointed. So the enemy would love for you just to walk in and say, yep, we got Jesus, but we're going to water it down a little bit and say we don't like the Holy Spirit in here. But if you don't want the Holy Spirit, then you don't want Jesus. Gonna get just, just, just a little bit. Some folks are watching online going, I don't know, I don't know. I don't want to go to that church. They, they, they talk in tongues. and Well, if you want Jesus... And Jesus is the one who baptizes people in the Holy Spirit. Then I think you ought to receive all that Jesus wants to give you in your life. Instead of saying, well, when I go to church, it tastes good and it feels good. But if it ain't the genuine thing, then it ain't real good. So send me email all you want about whether or not this church is going to be more Pentecostal. Yeah, it's going to be more Pentecostal. Why? Because it's on the day of Pentecost that the Spirit of God was poured out on the church. And we, if we want to have Bible things, then we ought to do Bible things. Oh, Pastor, you're kind of changing a little bit. No, we're not. We're just going back to doing the will of God and the Word of God over our lives. I don't want a church that has three lamps burning and people are wondering where the other four are. That's kind of bright on this side, but it's dark on that side. No, he is the light of the world. The lampstand represents both Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. May I tell you, it's impossible to separate the two. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ are spoken of as the same person in the same passage of Scripture. People want to separate them. Romans 8 and 9, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ are spoken of as the same person in the same passage of Scripture. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2 is where we get the seven spirits of God. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, the seven Spirits of God. And they were around the throne. That means they made it from the tabernacle to heaven. That also means that they're in this age too. Because we haven't made it to heaven yet. And we're still in this atmosphere right now. They didn't just leave the tabernacle and go to heaven. He's showing you that the seven spirits of God remain all the way from then all the way to then. And as we're right here in the middle. And the seven spirits of God still remain here. The fear of the Lord and wisdom and counsel and might. And all those things need to remain in God's house. Because the tabernacle was God's house. Let me say it like this. Know you not that you are the temple of the Most High? The seven spirits of God should be in your temple and in your tabernacle everywhere you go to. Well, I just want the Spirit of God to rest on me when I go to church. You are the temple of the Most High God. And everywhere you go, the seven spirits of God should go and the light should go with you. When you walk into Walmart and everybody else is losing their mind, you shouldn't be joining them. Why? Because you are the light of the world. When they cut you off in traffic, you shouldn't give them the bird out the window and say, yep, but just wait, you'll see the fish on my bumper. The first thing they should see is the light of the world, that there's something different about you because you have the wisdom and the counsel and the might and the spirit of the Lord all over your life. So everywhere you go, it should not be dark. It should be light because you are now the light light of the world because Jesus is now resting on the inside of you. Last point. I'm almost done. I got four minutes. Can you push that button you guys push when we're watching videos and speed them up to like to three speed? The lamp is the lamb. The priest purchased the bride. The lamp is the lamb. All the evidence seems to indicate that the lamps and the candlestick, when you read the scripture, were burning from evening sacrifice to morning sacrifice. 
In Exodus chapter 27, verse 20, And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure olive oil, beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. But then in the next verse, and then in Leviticus chapter 24, verses 2 and 3, it says, Aaron and his sons shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. From evening to morning. Now, when you read those scriptures, and I may get a little in-depth here, but just, just hang with me. When, when you read those scriptures and people say, well, the light burned the whole time, the only problem with taking that position, saying the light burned the whole time, and, or, or then there was times people would say, well, it didn't burn all the time, would be, well, if it didn't burn all the time, how did the priests officiate in the room when the lights weren't burning? But it said that they allowed the sacrifice, that this, the, these things were happening between evening to morning, meaning that from morning to evening, the lights were not burning. The hours that we're, we're kind of talking about here are the same hours that Jesus hung on the cross. The hours under consideration that many people say this was not burning, according to that scripture, was from 9 a.m., in the morning to about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. We read to you, there it said it would be from evening to morning, they would be burning. But then from morning to evening, they would not be burning. So from morning, 9, to evening, 3. How many of y'all want evening to be at 3? Get off work at 3, go to work at 9. I went to work in the morning, I got off in the evening. From 9 to 3, these were not burning. So we're talking about the same hours when Jesus was hanging on the cross. And during the three hours when Jesus hung on the cross... There was darkness throughout the land. And we were made to wonder if there is significance and are we still operating in the dark? If people are still operating in the dark, and I think we're seeing it more than we've ever seen it before in our world, that there are people who are really operating in the dark. And the importance of light is only known when you see it in the dark. I think our world has enjoyed light for so long, they no longer appreciate the light. Our nation has been a Christian nation for so long that we didn't appreciate that we were a Christian nation. We were able to come to church and act like nothing was going on for so long that we lost the appreciation for coming to church. We're now just a few months removed from the church not being open. And the very people who clamored for the church to be open no longer even attend. Because we now have lost the appreciation for the light. Pastor, you need to get church going again on Wednesday. Yep, about 10% of us join here on Wednesday nights. Pastor, we need prayer back in the church. Yep, about 5% of the church shows up for prayer meetings. We have lost the appreciation for the light. And if you don't think our world is getting dark, open up the newspapers. Look at what's going on in our world. Look at what our politicians are saying. Look at what our celebrities are saying. Look at the fight for murder in our streets. Look at what's happening all around us. There is no longer an appreciation for the light. Instead, now there is a disdain for the light. If we can just shut the churches down, if we can just shut the preachers up, if we can just shut the choirs up, if we can just shut the worshipers up, if we'll just shut the praisers up, the world will be a better place without the light. But when you get in darkness, there is a divine appreciation for the light. When things are going crazy and there seems to be no way to find direction, there is an appreciation for a lamp that will light your path. When, when things seem to be going crazy and hey, why you're saying, my goodness, the world is getting darker, that ought to be the time that there is an appreciation for that there is a church that is the light of the world. There ought to be an appreciation that we can come into this place and lift up holy hands to a holy God and we can worship and we can praise God and we're not in fear. There's no threats around us. We can just have an appreciation for the light of Jesus Christ. But I think far too many former believers, people who had a belief and now are unbelievers, are losing their appreciation for the light. They're losing their appreciation for what church is supposed to be. My friend, this is not a country club. 
This isn't even a cruise liner. My friend, this is a battlefield with a battleship. We're not here to play patty cake. We're not here to just tickle your ears. We're not here to play church. We're here to have a divine move of God. Because while you may not appreciate the light, there are people that are in darkness, steeped in addictions and hurts and hang-ups that are clamoring, if I could just see the light of Jesus Christ, if I could just find my way out of my situation. And what you're going to have is a great end-time revival and a great falling away happening. Those that are falling in love with the light and those that no longer appreciate the light. John chapter 12, Jesus said, yet a little while this light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whether he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of the light. And the purpose of this lampstand was more than merely to provide light for the priest to move about. The purpose of the light wasn't just for the priest to do work, but the purpose of the light was to reveal some things. It revealed the table of showbread. It revealed the altar of incense. It revealed the cherubim that were on the linen covering and the veil. You may, when you have the light, you see that he is the bread of life. When you have the light, you see his angels that are encamping around about them that fear him, those that are guarding around him. You see the, the, the incense. You see that sweet smelling savor that goes up into the nostrils of God. When you have the light, you get to see the bread that will, will quench your hunger. When you get to see the light, you see his angels that will minister to you and have guard over you when you have the light. But if you eliminate the light, you do not see the provision of God or the protection of God or the presence of God. I want God to protect me. Then you need the light of God. And the fact that that candlestick was made from a block of gold and beaten into shape, it was more than just a method of fabrication. The oil from the olives was extracted by human beating rather than by an olive press. The beating of that metal lampstand in the olives finds its final meaning in the beating and the bruising of our Savior. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10, it says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Isaiah 53 and verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. We already told you that gold is a symbol of his divine glory, glory, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything about it emphasized the gold, his purity and his deity. Everything is representing what God was trying to show the people that Jesus Christ is the light of of the world. He is beyond your imagination. He's not just a fabrication or a figment of our imagination. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and it is by his stripes. This isn't just a prayer that we pray. It isn't just some little thing that we go through here in church, but it is by his stripes that you are already healed. It isn't just something we say or something we do. It was something that was done. The gold is signifying the Godhead. And the light of the candlestick is a perfect, fitting, and divine symbol of Jesus Christ. It was written, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. In John chapter 1 and verse 9. In John chapter 8 and verse 12, and Jesus spoke again and said, I am the light of the world. And he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John chapter 9 and verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. First John 1, 5. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. When Jesus told the Jews, he said, I am the light of the world. In the very next verse, the Jews responded to Jesus. And he said, thou bearest record of thyself. And thy record is not true. He said, I am the light of the world. And they said, you're a liar. He said, I am the light of the world. And they said, that's not true. You're speaking of yourself. That's exactly what the original Jews said about Aaron. Who appointed you to be the high priest? 
Who appointed you? Your brother appointed you to be the high priest? And here's Jesus saying that your father appointed you to be high priest? I think we can do it better than you. As a matter of fact, we don't want anybody who has a little bit of nepotism to be our high priest or be our Messiah. You say you're the anointed one, but your record is not true. Let us just go through his record. He healed the blind to die, caused the lame to walk, opened up the deaf ear, walked on water, calmed storms, fed 5,000 with a happy meal, turned it into the golden corral, and yet his record is not true? Oh, no, you just bear record of yourself. So when he said, you're the light of the world, they said, you lie. Then in verse 28, Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. The lifting up that Jesus was talking about was him being lifted up on the cross. He was saying, in effect, that when you lift me up on the cross, then my Father will show you that I am the light of the world. They did, in fact, lift Jesus up on the cross. They nailed him to that cross, and for three hours, they mocked him. For three hours, they jeered him. They challenged him. Come down. You say, you're the son of God. Prove it. They blasphemed. They cursed. They ridiculed. They derided. They scorned. And for three hours, they were relentless in their verbal attacks. And then something happened. They said, you think you're the son of God? And at noon, God said, I'm going to turn the lights out on you. You think that you think you can do this all on your own? Then produce light without Jesus. You think you can win this world without Jesus? Then try it. Go ahead and have revival without me. You think you can change Southern Illinois without the light of Jesus? Then go ahead and try. And at the brightest moment of the day, God turned the lights out. They ridiculed and all of a sudden when the lights went out, all of the attacks and the verbal attacks and all of the hypocrisy and all the ridiculing and all the jeering, it went silent just as the lights went out. And our world today stands and jeers the church and the Christians and the believers and think that they can do it better on their own. But soon and very soon, God is going to do something again. And the light is getting ready to be taken out of this world. They think they can do it better without it. Then soon, they're going to be able to try. And a hush went over that crowd. It was so dark. All sense of direction was lost. You could hear a pin drop on Mount Calvary. The mountain that once was filled with jeers and ridiculing and mockery and challenges was silent. God hushed the mouth of the lion. He hushed their mockery. If you were on that mountain and no one could speak and no one could see and no one could find direction. After just a few moments of silence, some old rabbi, some old person who used to go to church, he'd say, well, I remember one day when we, we had an eclipse of the sun and it got dark. This will be over in no time. Nope. This was no eclipse of the sun. In an eclipse, it never gets completely black. It just lasts for just a few seconds too. This was no eclipse. Minutes went by. An hour went by. Two hours went by. From noon to three o'clock. The three brightest hours of the day, God said, turn the light out. No one was prepared for the darkness at noon. No one was prepared for the light to be turned out. We sit in the same scenario today. Well, we'll be prepared if he tells us when he's coming. 
We'll be prepared when we think it's going to happen. But Jesus said, I'm coming at a moment that you think not. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Pastor, when I think he's about to come, I'll give up my addiction. Pastor, when I think he's ready to come get me, I'll get right with him. You think you're living at noon. And what you don't realize is that in just a moment, the light is going to be turned out. And no doubt you're going to hear some old church person. They're going to say, we've heard this before. You've got time. You've got time. Just give it a little bit, and it'll be all right. But my friend, in a moment, and in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be gone. And those that have made their calling and election sure will be caught up to meet him in the air. And for the rest, they'll finally have an appreciation for the light. You must work the work of him while it is day, is what he said. You must walk while you have the light. And the light of Jesus has been in this place all day. And all he's doing is asking you to come and reflect his light. You don't have to be the light. You just need to carry the light. Is that too much to ask of the Christian believer? To just be what God has called us to be and to do what God has called us to do? But what we are allowing is for the enemy to put out our lights. And look around you. When you have no light, the person next to you has no direction. And as the enemy snuffs out your light, snuffs out your testimony, snuffs out your ministry, how will they ever find their way unless you are the light? And if you've lost your testimony and your light has been flickering and wavering and going dim, let me be the old preacher that says it's time to catch on fire for God. This is no time to hide your candle, your lamp under a bushel. This is time for the church to shine. The lights are down. The aisles are lit. But in just a moment, they're going to bring the lights up so you can step out of where you are and make your way down those aisles, those runways to Jesus. No prayer teams. No altar teams. But you coming to the light and saying, Lord, I don't want to be in darkness. Lord, I don't want my light to go out. Instead, I want to be on fire for you. I want my addiction to be gone, my hang-up to be gone, my hurt to be gone. I want my habits to be gone. Instead, God, I just want to be with you. So just for a moment, with every head bowed and with every eye closed, I pray the Holy Spirit would speak to every life that is in this place. To every person who is hanging on to that one last area. I'm not ready to give this up. Well, my friend, today is the day.
give it up. Today is the day to lay it on the altar. And today is the day to catch on fire for Jesus Christ. So Heavenly Father, have your way in every life, in every heart, in every mind, and every soul that is in this place. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 54, after the light had went out, a Roman centurion sees the light. After the darkness had hit, the Roman centurion says, truly, this was the Son of God. What the enemy had been trying to prevent, and in the midst of all of that darkness, a Roman centurion, the least likely person, says, truly, Truly, this was the Son of God. When the lights come on and we become the light of the world, the least likely people will be able to say, truly, Jesus is the Son of God. So as they sing this song, the lights are just going to come up just a little bit. There's anybody in this room that needs to make their way to an altar. This is the moment. This is the time to make your calling and your election yes and amen in your life. Awesome, awesome service we had today, right? I hope you enjoyed today's service just as much as we did. We enjoyed interacting with you today. We enjoyed praying with you and for you today. And if there's any other prayer requests that you have, please do not hesitate to let us know either in the comments, on the church app, or at siwcenter.org. We love, love praying with you. If you want to give and sow into this fertile ministry and word that you receive today, you can also do that on the church app or online at siwcenter.org forward slash give. However you feel moved to give today, to reach out today, or to engage. We invite it and we encourage it. I don't know about you, Cassie, but I am challenged to bring the light of the Lord wherever I go. Wherever I go. We are a lamp stands for Christ. And I will remember that and I hope you too. What would you like to share? Just share what I wanted to share. <laughs> Absolutely. Amen. Just keep that light on. Keep that yes. Light on. Keep that light on, as Pastor said, and carry it with you wherever you go, because there's coming a time when that light will be snatched up into the air and all will be darkness. And then the world will see how much the light we brought to them all. And so we love you. We pray for you. God bless them as they, uh, as they go about their day. In Jesus' name, amen.